Maximilien Robespierre, February 1794 On the Principles of Political Morality First published, Maximilien Robespierre, report upon the principles of political morality which are to form the basis of the administration of the interior concerns of the Republic, Philadelphia, 1794. Citizens, representatives of the people, some time since we laid before you the principles of our exterior political system, we now come to develop the principles of political morality which are to govern the interior. After having long pursued the path which chance pointed out, carried away in a manner by the efforts of contending factions, the representatives of the people at length acquired a character and produced a form of government. A sudden change in the success of the nation announced to Europe the regeneration which was operated in the national representation. But to this point of time, even now that I address you, it must be allowed that we have been impelled through the tempest of revolution, rather by a love of right and the feeling of the wants of our country, than by an exact theory and precise rules of conduct which we had not even leisure to sketch. It is time to designate clearly the purposes of the revolution and the point which we wish to attain. It is time we should examine ourselves the obstacles which yet are between us and our wishes and the means most proper to realize them, a consideration simple and important which appears not yet to have been contemplated. Indeed, how could a base and corrupt government have dared to view themselves in the mirror of political rectitude? A king, a proud senate, a Caesar, a Cromwell, of these the first care was to cover their dark designs under the cloak of religion, to covenant with every vice, caress every party, destroy men of probity, oppress and deceive the people in order to attain the end of their perfidious ambition. If we had not had a task of the first magnitude to accomplish, if all our concern had been to raise a party or create a new aristocracy, we might have believed, as certain writers more ignorant than wicked asserted, that the plan of the French Revolution was to be found written in the works of Tacitus and of Machiavel, we might have sought the duties of the representatives of the people in the history of Augustus, of Tiberius, or of Vespasian, or even in that of certain French legislators, for tyrants are substantially alike and only differ by trifling shades of perfidy and cruelty. For our part, we now come to make the whole world partake in our political secrets, in order that all friends of their country may rally at the voice of reason and public interest, and that the French nation and her representatives be respected in all countries which may attain a knowledge of their true principles, and that intriguers who always seek to supplant other intriguers may be judged by public opinion upon settled and plain principles. Every precaution must early be used to place the interests of freedom in the hands of truth, which is eternal, rather than those of men who change, so that if the government forgets the interests of the people or falls into the hands of men corrupted, according to the natural course of things, the light of acknowledged principles should unmask their treasons, and that every new faction may read its death in the very thought of a crime. Happy the people that attains this end! For whatever new machinations are plotted against their liberty, what resources does not public reason present when guaranteeing freedom? What is the end of our revolution? The tranquil enjoyment of liberty and equality, the reign of that eternal justice, the laws of which are graven, not on marble or stone, but in the hearts of men, even in the hearts of the slave who has forgotten them, and in that of the tyrant who disowns them. We wish that order of things where all the low and cruel passions are enchained, all the beneficent and generous passions awakened by the laws, where ambition subsists in a desire to deserve glory and serve the country, where distinctions grow out of the system of equality, where the citizen submits to the authority of the magistrate, the magistrate obeys that of the people, and the people are governed by a love of justice, where the country secures the comfort of each individual, and where each individual prides himself on the prosperity and glory of his country, where every soul expands by a free communication of republican sentiments, and by the necessity of deserving the esteem of a great people, where the arts serve to embellish that liberty which gives them value and support, and commerce is a source of public wealth and not merely of immense riches to a few individuals. We wish in our country that morality may be substituted for egoism, 
probity for false honor, principles for usages, duties for good manners, the empire of reason for the tyranny of fashion, a contempt of vice for a contempt of misfortune, pride for insolence, magnanimity for vanity, the love of glory for the love of money, good people for good company, merit for intrigue, genius for wit, truth for tinsel show, the attractions of happiness for the ennui of sensuality, the grandeur of man for the littleness of the great, a people magnanimous, powerful, happy for a people amiable, frivolous and miserable, in a word, all the virtues and miracles of a republic instead of all the vices and absurdities of a monarchy. We wish, in a word, to fulfill the intentions of nature and the destiny of man, realize the promises of philosophy, and acquit providence of a long reign of crime and tyranny. That France, once illustrious among enslaved nations, may, by eclipsing the glory of all free countries that ever existed, become a model to nations, a terror to oppressors, a consolation to the oppressed, an ornament of the universe, and that, by sealing the work with our blood, we may at least witness the dawn of the bright day of universal happiness. This is our ambition. This is the end of our efforts. Since virtue and equality are the soul of the Republic, and that your aim is to found, to consolidate the Republic, it follows that the first rule of your political conduct should be to let all your measures tend to maintain equality and encourage virtue, for the first care of the legislator should be to strengthen the principles on which the government rests. Hence all that tends to excite a love of country, to purify manners, to exalt the mind, to direct the passions of the human heart towards the public good, you should adopt and establish. All that tends to concenter and debase them into selfish egotism, to awaken an infatuation for littleness and a disregard for greatness, you should reject or repress. In the system of the French Revolution, that which is immoral is impolitic, and what tends to corrupt is counter-revolutionary. Weaknesses, vices, prejudices are the road to monarchy, carried away too often perhaps by the force of ancient habits, as well as by the innate imperfection of human nature, to false ideas and pusillanimous sentiments, we have more to fear from the excesses of weakness than from excesses of energy. The warmth of seal is not perhaps the most dangerous rock that we have to avoid, but rather that languor which ease produces and the distrust of our own courage. Therefore continually wind up the sacred spring of republican government instead of letting it run down. I need not say that I am not here justifying any excess. Principles the most sacred may be abused. The wisdom of government should guide its operations according to circumstances. It should time its measures, choose its means, for the manner of bringing about great things is an essential part of the talent of producing them, just as wisdom is an essential attribute of virtue. It is not necessary to detail the natural consequences of the principle of democracy. It is the principle itself, simple yet copious, which deserves to be developed. Republican virtue may be considered as it respects the people and as it respects the government. It is necessary in both. When, however, the government alone wanted, there exists a resource in that of the people, but when the people themselves are corrupted, liberty is already lost. Happily, virtue is natural in the people, despite aristocratical prejudices. A nation is truly corrupt when, after having by decrees lost its character and liberty, it slides from democracy into aristocracy or monarchy. This is the death of the political body by decrepitude. But when, by prodigious efforts of courage and reason, a whole people break asunder the fetters of despotism to make of the fragments trophies to liberty, when, by their innate vigor, they rise in a manner from the arms of death, to resume all the strength of youth then, in turns forgiving and inexorable, intrepid and docile, they can neither be checked by impregnable ramparts, nor by innumerable armies of tyrants leagued against them, and yet of themselves stop at the voice of the law. If then they do not reach the heights of their destiny, it can only be the fault of those who govern. Again, it may be said that to love justice and equality, the people need no great effort of virtue. It is sufficient that they love themselves. If virtue be the spring of a popular government in times of peace, the spring of that government during a revolution is virtue combined with terror. 
Virtue without which terror is destructive. Terror without which virtue is impotent. Terror is only just as prompt, severe and inflexible. It is then an emanation of virtue. It is less a distinct principle than a natural consequence of the general principle of democracy, applied to the most pressing wants of the country. It has been said that terror is the spring of despotic government. Does yours then resemble despotism? Yes, as the steel that glistens in the hands of the heroes of liberty resembles the sword with which the satellites of tyranny are armed. Let the despot govern by terror his debased subjects. He is right as a despot. Conquer by terror the enemies of liberty and you will be right as founders of the republic. The government in a revolution is the despotism of liberty against tyranny. Its force only intended to protect crime is not the lightning of heaven made to blast vice exalted. The law of self-preservation, with every being, whether physical or moral, is the first law of nature. Crime butchers innocence to secure a throne, and innocence struggles with all its might against the attempts of crime. If tyranny reigned one single day, not a patriot would survive it. How long yet will the madness of despots be called justice, and the justice of the people barbarity or rebellion? How tenderly oppressors and how severely the oppressed are treated? Nothing more natural. Whoever does not abhor crime cannot love virtue. Yet one or the other must be crushed. Let mercy be shown the royalists, exclaim some men. Pardon the villains. No. Be merciful to innocence. Pardon the unfortunate. Shown compassion to human weakness. The protection of government is only due to peaceable citizens. And all citizens in the republic are republicans. The royalists, the conspirators, are strangers, or rather enemies. Is not this dreadful contest, which liberty maintains against tyranny indivisible, are not the internal enemies the allies of those in the exterior, the assassins who lay waste the interior, the intriguers who purchase the consciences of the delegates of the people, the traitors who sell them, the mercenary libelists paid to dishonor the cause of the people, to smother public virtue, to fan the flame of civil discord, and bring about a political counter-revolution by means of a moral one. All these men, are they less culpable or less dangerous than the tyrants whom they serve? To punish the oppressors of humanity is clemency, to forgive them is cruelty. The severity of tyrants has barbarity for its principle, that of a republican government is founded on beneficence. Therefore let him beware who should dare to influence the people by that terror which is made only for their enemies. Let him beware who, regarding the inevitable errors of civism in the same light with the premeditated crimes of perfidiousness, or the attempts of conspirators, suffers the dangerous intriguer to escape and pursues the peaceable citizen. Death to the villain who dares abuse the sacred name of liberty or the powerful arms intended for her defense, to carry mourning or death to the patriotic heart.